John. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, and thank you much, everybody, for attending. Um, we're, uh, I expect we've probably got some more people still coming in, uh, but I think we'll go ahead and out of respect for the folks who are here. Uh, we're repeating the session on Saturday anyway. Uh, and so if uh, <laughs> anybody misses the front part and they want to come in and pick it up on Saturday, they can. Uh, but it's good to have the folks that are here. Uh, we've got uh, three items that we've listed on the agenda uh, that uh, Peter has sent out. And I've got a few small items that I'll flag at the end. And if we have uh, time for open discussion, that's great. Uh, but we will try to keep it to an hour. And uh, I'm certainly around for longer if people want to stay to have any open discussion. But uh, we'll try to at least get through the agenda items in that time. The first item uh, is one that is, uh, of course, it w should get uh, a bit of interest because it involves money. Uh, and it has to do with the cost of pets and how we're handling the pets registrations. And we sent out a note uh, ahead of time on that. I, I'd be hopeful that we could do that in the first half of the meeting and uh, because it can be fairly open-ended when we talk money, but uh, we'll, we need to take the time we need to take because we are planning a proposal to the annual general meeting that will increase dues. And uh, the dues uh, will uh, encompass uh, everything and we've had some inflation and we've moved from COVID into a, uh, a world of post-COVID. Uh, so uh, there are some cost increases apart from pets, but this is uh, the one item on the budget that's quite significant that we want to talk about. Uh, and what we are doing uh, is moving the cost of pets registrations for presidents elect from the club paying, which has been the history of this, to the district paying, which has the effect of moving it from a per club basis to a per Rotarian basis in terms of the net effect. Uh, we sent a note out ahead and uh, there's a bit of history to this. So I'm gonna go into a bit of the background because of course, not everybody has been around for all of the background. <laughs> uh, and the cost of pets is something that has been uh, a concern uh, for different clubs for a long time. Uh, and I'm gonna pick this up really from about uh, 2020 when we had a dialogue with the president's elect at pets, the last pets that was held. Uh, and we talked about uh, before, before this last weekend, uh, the last face-to-face -face one. And we talked about different ways to handle uh, the cost of uh, attending pets. And it was more than registration. It was a combination of registration and, uh, and travel. Uh, <clears throat> and we prepared a paper with a number of options. And we asked the uh, assistant governors to collect uh, feedback from the clubs after pets in 2020. We did a survey essentially. Uh, to get the results as to what the club felt. So felt among uh, four uh, different options in terms of how to pay for pets. And uh, we looked at the status quo, which then was the club's pay for all registration and travel costs. Uh, we looked at um, whether district would pay for registrations, which is the proposal that's uh, in front of us. Uh, we looked at whether district would pay the registrations plus travel and uh, do that for all the clubs and um, whether we would pay only for district would pay only for um, clubs that uh, declared hardship and needed assistance. So we looked at all of those and asked what clubs felt. There was no consensus around one option, uh, but uh, <clears throat> the great majority of clubs did want a change away from the club only pays option. Uh, and uh, there were more in favor of the option that we are pursuing than, than others, but it was uh, certainly <laughs> spread out. Um, so that's, that, that's the, the, the background. Um, this year, we then decided that because we had a carryover uh, in terms of money in the district budget, we were able to fund this the first year. 
in terms of paying for the pets registrations for all the PEs. And we were going to do that, uh, but COVID didn't let us. Uh, and so we lost two years of this to COVID, of face-to-face -face pets. So we rolled it forward and paid for pets registrations this year out of the um, accumulated monies from district. But of course, uh, that you can do that once. <laughs> you can't keep doing that. So as we've said all along, and as we've said in notes to each of the last two AGMs, we would plan to uh, carry this on, but it will mean a dues increase. And the dues increase is in the neighborhood of 30 to $35 per Rotarian, all other things being equal, um, which of course they aren't. Uh, so there will be other things come into this. Uh, in fact, this year, some uh, PEs were not able to attend pets in person and, and uh, di we did other things and, and there was a saving there. So if there's some of that going on, it, the cost would be slightly less. And we will have to get that a little more precise, of course, in terms of what we present to the AGM uh, as a proposal for our budget and for our dues for the coming year. Uh, and this year we did include a pilot project to provide some assistance for travel. And that's needs based and it's up to a maximum of half of the travel cost. And the, the issue here um, that you get into the why do this and the why do this is that we want all the clubs, to, all the presidents elect to be at pets in person. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we always have shot for. Uh, Rotary International says that attending pets is compulsory. Uh, there are different ways to do it now, uh, including some online, but we found, and uh, this year has, I think, reinforced it, that the benefits of in-person pets are fantastic. Uh, we get better learning. Uh, we get better interaction. Uh, we get better exposure to that that wonderful multi-district pets that we have with uh, 10 districts working together and it attracts the kind of speakers like the incoming president of Rotary International. I mean, people here will, well, many of you will know all of this, but not everybody. And because uh, certainly this group of presidents, uh, because we weren't able to be face-to-face -face last year, didn't have that, that wonderful experience. Uh, and we think as a district, we're stronger together uh, if we're all getting to pets. Uh, our clubs are stronger and we work better together. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it's remarkable the uh, kind of energy and uh, enthusiasm that ends up getting built as uh, people go to pets and uh, see some of what everybody else is doing and get inspired. Uh, we have a challenge with small clubs and large clubs. Uh, there is, uh, we have quite a range in our district and with um, clubs that are near Vancouver and clubs that aren't. And when you look at that together, uh, we have uh, the particularly vulnerable people here are small clubs that aren't in Vancouver. And uh, because it's sort of the double whammy, uh, it's much more expensive on a per Rotarian basis for them to fund the uh, cost of somebody going to pets. And, and we're talking big differences, like uh, it, it can be 10 times as much uh, for a really small club in terms of how much they are paying per Rotarian uh, from club funds to get their president-elect to pets. And yet, as a Rotarian, you don't benefit particularly more or less if you're in a big club or a small club from having your president-elect go to pets. So there's a fairness issue there that I appreciate can be looked at in lots of different ways, but we've had a lot of discussion and I think we're close to a consensus and certainly your governor team feels that we are fairer if we go forward on the basis of the proposal. Um, <clears throat> the, um, and of course this means compared with the old model uh, that each uh, Rotarian would now pay the same towards pets every Rotarian in the district, but uh, that is for the registration. We still leave the travel uh, as that the travel is still unequal where uh, the further away clubs are, they, we have a pilot, they may get some assistance down the road, but it, it's, it's not proposed at all that we, we pay full, full travel. Uh, 
and we hope that the larger clubs will who will pay more uh, will uh, be willing to look at this from the standpoint uh, that we're making we're all making a contribution to Rotary uh, and the broad community we serve uh, if we bring this together uh, so that we're really encouraging everybody to uh, get to pets and uh, have the benefit of that experience. Uh, so I am going to shut up there uh, and ask if anybody, Lauren, uh, you, you're, of course, very experienced with this. If you want to add, and then uh, we'll go on and open it. Yeah, two, two things, John. And one is uh, we sent out last year a dues philosophy and that many of the club's dues uh, are related to this issue because at the end of the day, anything that you raise above the $200 mark, which is what considered the break-even point from a Rotary International and a district perspective, is was to be spent either on sending your president to pre, to to pets or to coming to district conferences etc and so we really don't see any incremental increase in your dues although some clubs may be thinking that the cost of rotary is becoming expensive and we don't think this is that much of a significant change because you're just paying it differently uh, the second thing is that when you go to pets uh, we're now going to you'll see a little later on today in the foundation world we're really encouraging collaboration and district grants that are done by areas and potentially district wide. And to think about that, that's a significant change from a club uh, just presenting itself for district grants and global grants. We're really encouraging more collaboration. And the best way to do that is by attending pets. And that's my opinion. Okay, thanks very much, Lauren. And yeah, and 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 to clarify, it is a zero sum game. It's it's not an extra cost overall. It's just how we pay, how we split up paying for that cost. And uh, I hope people aren't taking a total um, uh, sort of simply pure accounting uh, perspective here. But it, it clubs that are around thirty, just slightly under thirty, uh, is the break point where clubs that are smaller than that will pay a little less, and clubs that are larger than that will pay more but it equalizes per Rotarian. Uh, okay, discussion, questions? Nobody wants to go first. <laughs> John, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll, I'll ask just for clarification. Um, so that kind of takes care of all the president elects. What about everybody else, all the staff per se that attend PETS? on behalf of District 5040. Okay, that um, is, is uh, there are a number of other people that attend PETS and this proposal uh, has, it does not touch that at all. This proposal is quite pure to the president elect world. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I, I need to answer your question still, but I just want to give that as the preface is that it, well, I'll answer the question. It doesn't relate to this, to, to the uh, proposal. Uh, because we're doing this either way. Uh, uh, we, what happens with other people attending is that we have people attending uh, the assistant governors, uh, the, which is the uh, current assistant governors except those in their third year, and the incoming district governors, or sorry, assistant governors rather. The, the, um, so, we, so we have them attending, uh, and they are on... Uh, the district dime as it were, but I'm gonna say more about that. Uh, and we have the uh, district governor elect and the district governor nominee and uh, some, sometimes the district governor uh, nominee designate attending. However, uh, the other, uh, and also we have a number of trainers who are attending. Uh, Pets has a number of trainers and of course they come from here, uh, from the different districts. Now, the way the expenses work is that the uh, people that we are sending uh, directly, like the assistant governors and our governor team, we pay for. But those are expenses that are eligible for the Rotary International allotment that each district governor is given uh, from RI to cover expenses, which include uh, a, a variety of expenses uh, like the district governor visits and some other some other things and but can include uh, a, a lot of training. Um, the trick is that, of course, they don't give us enough to cover everything we want to do. So we end up having to uh, pay more from district to cover all of these. But for what it's worth, that is uh, 
uh, that, that is eligible and we typically do pay uh, from that fund for uh, pets, for the, for the people above for pets. Now then there's the people uh, that are doing training for pets. Uh, and those people are paid for by pets. Uh, pets pays their expenses to go there. Uh, of course, at the end of the day, we all pay because uh, <laughs> the pets registration fee pays for uh, for pets expenses, of course. So it, 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 yeah, but Lauren, did, did, is that a, a full enough description or do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, that's the winning, the winning formula is making sure you have five to six training leaders that are all leaders within your district. And if you get them all paid for by pets, it's much cheaper, but that's uh, not so easy to do because you have to be front and center coaching and teaching and facilitators, which uh, which is not everybody's cup of tea. So so, so how many staff do, does our district actually pay for on average for pets? Like trainers, so, sorry, training. Oh, well, no, the trainers we don't pay for. Pets pays for them. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but the thing is, and that's where, you know, if you're lucky, like you, if you've got a couple of your assistant governors that are trainers, uh, you know, that's that's the kind uh, of thing that, that, yeah. that Lauren's talking about. If, okay, if got they, it. Then you duck having to pay for them. Okay. And just my last question then is you, you mentioned the AGs, you send year one and two. Why do they go two years? Uh, they go three years. They go the year that they're about to become an assistant governor. And then they go in year uh, two and three. Or yep. year one and two, and the reason that they go for three years is is really uh, is really twofold. One one is that um, they do get a little bit of uh, training themselves that, that pets put on, but that's not really the main thing. The main thing is that they're there with their uh, presidents elect, and as well as uh, for for our district, we do pre pets work there as well, and uh, we um, and and during pets, as you probably remember, there is a district session and. We really want the uh, assistant governors to have that connection with their presidents elect and lead their group of presidents elect. Because one of the things that uh, makes us, uh, we think, rather more effective is when the areas can work well together. And some areas work more closely than others for a bunch of reasons, including geography. Uh, and how well they, 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 they have that kind of synergy. But one of the things that uh, we really like to encourage is the assistant governors having that great relationship with their president-select and the president-select with each other. So they all come together at PET. Thank you. Jan. So just to clarify, the other role that the AGs have is they're kind of required to run PETs. They, um, a bunch of them get used as session support for the actual facilitators and they also do sergeant at arms duties so all of the they don't have any time to just lollygag around <laughs> they're busy and uh yeah so they have to sign up to actually perform a function when they're not at a district session or in ag training so okay other questions well, I guess my question would be, um, given that I was president-elect through COVID, so I had to do everything online, um, and given uh, remote locations and the expense of traveling to Vancouver, um, will you still be running um, digital remote um, sessions alongside the in-person stuff? Because I, I think that you can't let that go. I think that's got to continue. I, I don't think um, a wholesale, uh, let's go straight to back to in person, even though I understand all of the interpersonal human connections and relations that are a part of that. I, I sometimes I somewhat don't think that's realistic. Uh, we are using both tools, but I'm I and and I'm going to. Luckily, we've got somebody here that's much more qualified than I am to answer that. Uh, Jan is our uh, learning. Speaking of wearing different hats, Jan is our uh, learning and development chair, uh, and she's part of the training group, which has a catchy name that I forget. Uh, it's not quite Trainers Anonymous, but Jan will tell us what it is. Uh, and so she's very much into the philosophy that uh, 
is being adopted with with pets generally and with our district. And we're absolutely using uh, those different tools. Uh, but and Jen, moreover, as our uh, uh, governor nominee, yeah, governor nominee designate uh, is uh, going to be dealing with pets two years out as the governor elect. So, uh, you know, she, she's uh, able to uh, tell you a little bit about what she thinks is coming in the future. I take your point, Jane. Um, the, it's been a huge learning curve and, and I, I have great sympathy for the presidents who had to do everything virtually. I actually kept track of what Ross Cooper did and I went, I think he spent like, he had 28 online sessions just doing all those online courses, all the pre, you know, and we still did a lot of pre pets stuff, you know, this year with Peter Clark, <clears throat> sorry. And, um, and I'm actually here tonight because I am a PE. So I attended pets as a PE and I still think there's lots of changes we can make to make it better. Um, the comments I heard from other PEs at the table, especially the younger ones, is they wanted more nuts and bolts. Mm. And um, this year we did it different in that we took away this group that he's talking about, the Pacific Northwest Pets Districts, District Trainers, we call ourselves District Trainers Anonymous because it's a support group as we fight to make changes. I shouldn't say the word fight, but um, as we, um, <clears throat> try to promote changes to how we get presidents and, and really president-elects get the skills they need and the knowledge they need that's specific to the clubs. So the core courses we, we took over doing at the district level. And just for those of you that attended our district session on Friday afternoon, I thought Peter Clark and Shirley Pat did a phenomenal job. They wove the information from foundation membership, um, public image, and leadership seamlessly through their whole presentation. So nobody went, oh, well, we're now in the foundation course and we're now in the, you know. So I think a lot of president elects wouldn't have even realized they've now been trained in those four core courses, which used to happen at Pat, so um, how many changes will we make for next year? I hope some. Do I hope that they're all perfect by the time I'm the DGE? I, I would love to think that, but um, I think that going forward, we need to be able to be adaptable and have some stuff through the Learning Center because it's really got good quality content. Some stuff like this, Zoom meetings, and some stuff in person. But I agree, at one point we were doing pre-pets down there, which for me meant going down on Wednesday and getting back late Sunday night. I'm sorry, that's too long, mm -hmm. I right? Agree. Like the time we spend in Seattle has to be shorter. And, you know, I think we had electives this year, which they did they dropped all the elect electives. <clears throat> And they didn't even want to have them this year. And we fought like crazy to get those electives. And they were sold out within minutes of registration opening. And they had to put in more classes. They sold out. They put in more classes. So we're going to be struggling to, to, to promote more electives. So president-elects that need to know how to do succession planning, that need to know how to structure their board, that they can take the what they need as opposed to the generic thing. There will still be some generic, but some people, they come from a club that have great succession planning. They know how to run a, a meeting, but there's lots that are really struggling out there because for, for a variety of reasons, you know, there's about 600 clubs and President-elect should be able to pick the classes they actually need. So that's my two cents. But any feedback you guys get from anybody, I'm, I, I want to have it because the only way we can improve is, is to listen to the presidents and the president-elects. So 
So, Did I answer your question, John or, or Jane? <laughs> well, Jane, yeah. So um, my current president-elect, who has been a president before, is headed down to Seattle. And yep. I'm going to be very interested um, to talk to her about how much um, information, informational content, she's she got. been able to process. Yeah. Um, I... You know, when you're kibbutzing with people, I mean, I yeah, I've I've done conferences through the uh, the stratosphere over years. Um, there's a lot that you learn off the sidelines, right? A lot you learn in the little, uh, you know, contretemps that you have in the bar or whatever. And I get they don't get much time. They're in classes pretty much all the time, but they're doing it different than they used to in that it's facilitated. So. You know, the, the facilitator in theory, and, and it's true, when they break us into little tables and, and pose the question or give us the task, that's where the learning happens from the other people at your table, and then they report back. So it's an interactive thing. It is not sitting there listening to somebody talk the whole time. In, yeah. Unless it's a facilitator that didn't quite get the memo. It, exactly. <laughs> but as a, I, I'm a piece... Um, facilitator. Conversation facilitates. So we do the same thing. Yeah. And, and the way we're doing them is all online, all on Zoom. And we go into breakout rooms. So I, I get yeah. where you're coming from. But I would say, I think the quality of what I learned online, um, other than the camaraderie and the social aspect of meeting in person, was good. And and maybe more crystallized, and maybe more focused for me. I took notes. I could think about what I was hearing and listening, and I didn't have a lot of distraction. So I, I just want to say that I, I think the um, online um, Zoom quality that I I, I thought uh, Rotary did an amazing job. I didn't feel like I was, um, and I was told by some of my uh, elder peers in the country, <laughs> oh, you didn't get to the, didn't, and I, I didn't feel diminished or, um, you know, I, I felt like I got something that was of quality online. I, I think I probably, because I committed to it, I think I probably learned more than some of my compatriots who went to the uh, in-person thing, quite frankly. But that's, you know, I mean, they. And that's great. That, that's great feedback. It's way superior. Yeah. I, I would disagree with that. Okay, Jane, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in yeah. here and close close off the discussion. Yeah. We're a little way away from the paying for pets, but the, the the thing is, this is a very valid discussion. And I'm gonna close it by saying that I was through this last year when I was uh, governor elect. So I was I was through last year in earnest and. Um, the, I think the point is well taken uh, about the uh, Rotary, and it was true for the governor training as well. And Lauren and I were both uh, uh, people that missed the International Assembly governor training, which, uh, like pets, only sort of maybe multiply, uh, has got a wonderful reputation for all the interaction as well as the content. And so the thing is, I've seen it from both of them. P people learn differently. And some people are like you, Jane, and love the the uh, the online, and and they get a lot out of it, and it works well. Uh, I have had all sorts of feedback from a lot of other people that simply don't learn that way, uh, in it nearly as well. And we also see that in terms of participation. Uh, we saw that with pets last year in terms of participation. Frankly, it wasn't very good in terms of the uh, people uh, attending each session. And that's only people that actually clicked on each session. That doesn't mean they were actually there paying attention. Uh, and so I think we, we, we have this variety. And I think it's great that one of the things coming out of uh, COVID is that we have learned different ways of doing things. And we make much better use of some of our electronic options. But uh, I think they work a lot better in combination. And uh, that's the direction we're moving. And uh, it's going to be trial and error. And uh, Jan is... Uh, all over this and her colleagues and uh you know there'll be things that work better than others and hopefully we find out so with that i'd like to um, move on if that's okay and our next item is uh to talk about uh 
district grants. And I'm not gonna spend any time with a preface here because we've got somebody that can do any preface he wants and get into the content because Lauren is our uh, chair of our uh, district foundation committee. So Lauren, I'm just gonna turn this over to you. Thank you, thank you, John. I thought I'd share a few slides, uh, not just on district grants and, and it might go a little off topic, but I, I think it's all similar. One is that uh, we're in this transitioning period. This is when the president still have a bit of time left to do things, and the president elects uh, are are trying to get up to speed. and And the transitioning and the handoff is so critical. And I got to tell you that I was so impressed. I've been so impressed with this district and its role that it's played in the setting of goals under Rotary Club Central. And I want to show you kind of the outcome that comes because of the completeness that has happened in Rotary Club Central. And I put together a couple slides. And I won't spend a lot of time on it. So it's a, it's a busy slide, but what this what we're able to do with everybody's input into Rotary Club Central and the setting of goals and keeping your fundraising, your projects, your, your ability to stand there and show uh, your volunteer hours has a big, big impact on our ability to kind of deliver on some of this. And so we've done some analysis that says to us that, you know what, we do a remarkable amount of, amount of work on behalf of those 1,200 and 20, 1,250 Rotarians. Do you realize that this district generates over $4.2 million worth of economic impact every year? And it's because of our fundraising abilities which jumped from 1.4 million to 1.7. And I know that if we see the projects that are being done this year, they're running ahead of last year's pace. And it's just talking about the synergies that we're seeing at the club level. But we've also seen over 62,000 volunteer hours uh, given last year. And we're seeing this being under underreported this year. And we really like to encourage people to kind of go in and make sure your Rotary Club Central goals are up to date because it allows us to measure this impact that we have on the world. And the fact is, is that this tells us a story and we can tell it by region. We can tell it by area. We can tell it by club if we want to, because we have the form. I call it the GDP of District 5040 because these are every year we do this on a regular basis. Last year, uh, because we had people set goals in this district has set a record in zone 28 of having the highest percentage of goals set in Rotary Club Central in zone 28. And when you think about that, for the last three years, we've had over 90 to 95% of the clubs have set goals in Rotary Club Central. And thanks to the assistant governors and Nancy's support systems, we have developed a situation which has seen significant growth in the number of awards, certificates and banners that have been earned by clubs. In 2019, 20, when we started this, we are handing it out around 44 awards. In Dave, uh, Dave um, ha Hamilton's year, we actually jumped to 88 awards, which I think is remarkable. And the last year we did over 136 awards. And this sends a message to your clubs that you guys are doing the right things at the right methodologies, the right time you are focused on your communities and your service activities and your engagement. Last year, our Ukraine uh, support was remarkable. And I gotta give a big shout out to Rotary International because when they came up with the Focus Disaster Response Fund grant for Ukraine, I personally could not believe the amount of monies that were raised in literally just two months, $15.5 million. And I, I actually was part of a committee, a group of people that met every three weeks and we saw over, uh, we, we looked at these, these response fund grants and we're part of a large number of the 400 grants that were proposed in this thing, including a multi-district response grant for the rigid inflatable boat and diving equipment that are hopefully gonna be used to clean up the waterways in Ukraine. Because think of all the debris and the equipment that's being left in the rivers and the, and the lakes and the fact that they don't have uh, fresh water. But this district last year raised over $300,000 Canadian including 130,000 to the Disaster Response Fund grant for Ukraine, 25,000 that was given out of our district designated funds, and also $110,000 in other ways of giving to the Ukraine based on what clubs giving was last year. And it's something that we, we need to continue to watch and see what the outcomes of that were. And I can tell you that by meeting up with my peers across six different districts and over nine Ukrainians in District 2232, 
they are very, 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 very thankful and very positive because we've created hope for them. This year, uh, our eye has set up three more funds. One is for Pakistan. They've had a extremely disastrous um, a, a monsoon that hit their, their country literally in last October, November. And they're still feeling the aftermaths of that disaster. There were villages like Linton, as we've been known last year, have been wiped out and, and farmlands. And so they're looking for relief in some way. And there's not a lot of roadie clubs in Pakistan and there's only one district. And so they have to work uh, 10 times harder to get some support. And so RI has set up a separate fund for the disaster response for Pakistan. Uh, they are going for a second tranche for Ukraine. And we're looking to raise monies between, uh, between this uh, February uh, right through to the end of December, which has to be spent by the end of June. And just recently, they just set up a disaster response fund for Turkey and Syria. And I can't tell you how heartfelt that is because we've seen the disasters in the media. We know that they need help. And so I have a challenge out there that I hope that you guys will take back to your clubs. And if people can, uh, please, please think about uh, making a difference in the world and looking at giving 100 Canadian or US dollars to one or all three. If you want to spread it out, you can do so. We actually set goals uh, and why we set goals and why this district has been so focused on this. The fact is that we've had clubs with five years of positive membership growth in, uh, in across around the world. And the study goes along the ways of saying that 87% of those clubs who've had five years of positive growth have uh, set goals in Rotary Club Central. And so what gets measured gets done. We also believe that as you're working through to the end of the year and hopefully on the handoff to your present election next year, by, by working towards achieving your Rotary Citation, it sends a message to your club that it's important that we track certain things, that we monitor certain things, and that we take actions to try and achieve certain things. And if we, if we can just do the goal setting strictly in membership foundation, it helps the both the district membership chair and the district foundation chair on ways to help develop strategies and to support those clubs and develop action plans so that we can increase our impact and increase our reach, uh, both at your, your, the district level and at the club level. And so, and as I already showed you, they already determined the economic impact, or I call it the gross domestic product of Rotary in, in our world. Last year, our district grants, uh, we had a trouble. We, we, we did all the training last year in March. Uh, we did not have our spending planned achieved until November of this year. And because of the lateness of this, we actually had a couple of projects that had to be taken off the drawing board strictly because they had to get them done and they couldn't wait uh, for the district grant funds to be made available. Every district in the world is required to have 85% of all the dollars that are becoming to them in their district designated funds to be committed for. So last year we had $54,000 US, which worked out to around 73,000 Canadian. And for us to proceed forward in getting our spending plan so that we can actually hand the money off to each of the clubs within the district, we needed district grant applications totaling $62,000. We didn't get that total until November of 2021. Next year, we actually have a bump uh, because we did so well uh, in 2020, 2021 where we're looking at around $72,000, $73,000 US, which is around $100,000 Canadian. And so we definitely need uh, the clubs and the area specifically to think about types of projects that they would like to see and get district grant money starting uh, as soon as possible. We're gonna do the training again in March, uh, but we learned from a zone um, presentation just recently that we actually can start to apply for a spending plan as early as March or April of the year before uh, the road year starts. And so we're gonna do the uh, grants management program in November or December of next year. The fact is, is that the sooner that we get this done, there's more surety and more, uh, more purpose that the clubs can actually go out and do the projects that they really want to do. So we definitely would like to see the spending plan achieved by May. Uh, we've been pitching for the end of July and we've been missing the mark because we haven't had people wanting to spend the time and energy to write grants up. So we're gonna be holding a grant management uh, course um, in uh, on March 16th, 18th or 23rd, 25th. We're just uh, just talk targeting uh, the people who have to be around 
uh, to present that and picking the best date, but please put those uh, two dates on your uh, sessions. And mentioned earlier, we're looking at grant management seminars in November, December, so we can get these grant applications submitted much earlier in the road year. One thing to leave you with note, and I think this will be a significant change next year if it's possible, is we're looking at putting in area grant writing workshops. We really believe that a lot of clubs have, have donated large sums of money to the Rody Foundation and have not applied for a district grant or a global grant in many years. And the one thing we don't want to be stuck with is, is the fact that a club that's been very giving comes back in looking for a, a funding source, either at a district or global grant, and finding out the money's not available for them. So we really want to work on some grant writers, and we'd like to have one grant writer in each of the nine areas in District 5040. We do believe that this grant writer could be used as a tool to look at collaboration efforts on projects and district grants, looking for some larger scale and higher impact uh, projects, but also projects that have some high visibility. Because at the end of the day, we need to use what I call, or what Shirley Pat calls, the triangle of awesomeness. And it's important that we understand that if we use our foundations uh, strategically, uh, that we promote it through our public relations and public image, that we also will increase our membership. And we really do think that triangle of awesomeness is critical for us to be a successful uh, Rotary District. We also are going to be next year expecting that any projects that are funded uh, on the district grant or global grant, that they must provide projects and uh, some type of narrative written up uh, a project list, and that these projects are going to be shared on Showcase, which is actually on the District 5040 website. So Peter Rofe has started up Showcase. It's one of the ways that we can share uh, some of our project ideas and see if other people would like to participate with us, both at a district or global grant basis. And I would like to also see that some, some measure of success be given on a maybe a district-wide global grant, just so that we can make a bigger impact. And we know that there are regions around the world that need our help. So I'll stop and share again and ask for any questions. Okay, well, thank Let's... you very much, Lauren. Uh, I, I really appreciate that run through. Uh, and I am so delighted that we're moving the uh, that, that we've got a you know a really vibrant uh, foundation committee, uh, and we're stepping this up in terms of the timing so that we're going to make it that much more useful and relevant as far as the clubs are concerned. And so, uh, Liz, Liz has a question, uh, John. Yep. Liz. Um. Thanks. Um. A couple of things, Laura. One of your early slides in the presentation, you had some numbers because I know you're a numbers guy. Um, are those numbers generated from the KPI sheets that we fill out? I think yeah, so I actually got, I want to stress the importance of why we do that to our clubs. So I get those numbers from three sources. One is through actual results on the foundation side because they are actual. Uh, we also get them through KPIs and also on what has been uh, presented at the project listing levels uh, from a volunteer hours and fundraising perspective. So they come in three different pots. And they're all important, but they do feed through your KPI or exercise list. Okay. Uh, the other shout out is that some areas have been very good at the collaboration efforts. And I want to put a big shout out to the uh, Terrace area uh, with Ron Melmas. They're working on a project, but also Liz and the Sea Sky. You guys have done a remarkable job on a district grant proposal, but also on a global grant proposal. And it's that types of projects that we would like to, we would like to support. Okay, thanks. And... Um... I, I just have one other comment. I love the idea of March of the, of the mm -hmm. like, let's say this year, March, um, getting grants organized, which um, speaks to me to strategic planning with the clubs and the P coming back from pets, all jazzed up about everything, working with the club, getting ready for the new year. I think that's the time we need to hit the ground running with our strategic plan for the following year, our grant opportunities, our project opportunities, it seems like the spring is the time to set the stage for your next year. And I really hope that we can work together to try and make sure that we can do that work early on in the PE and, and the outgoing president's year. Um, Thanks, Liz. Yeah. I, I really think that's an important time for all of us. And John Bathurst has a team as a team out there, but he's also very good at, at giving his time. So use the skill sets in the district. They're very, very good. 
And I and I want to say thank thank you, Liz, especially for bringing that up because that segues exactly into the third item on the agenda. Uh, we, <laughs> and and that is to emphasize this group is 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 mainly it's a president's forum. There there are different people on this call, but I'm really aiming this at the presidents. Uh, and that is to say that. Uh, the presidents elect are coming back from pets, having been told a lot of wonderful messages, as Liz has pointed out, about how they need to be planning and getting ready and going forward and working with their club about next year. And I want to ask that the presidents reinforce that concept big time with the president elect and your club, because there can be a tendency for people to want to defer to this year's president and say, oh, well, it's their year. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to confuse things and trample on their year. And I think it's really up to us. Uh, and it's true in the governor world too. It's, it, it's up to us to say, look, we need continuity and we need transition if we're gonna be doing the best that we can with our organization. And yes, we want to finish strong. Absolutely, we want to finish our year strong. But also part of finishing strong is setting the stage for next year, which you really need to uh, encourage people to work with your president-elect now. As they come back from pets, now is the time. We talked about the, 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 the foundation, but it applies to everything else, uh, the strategic planning, the, the, depending on where you are. I mean, I know you may already have a strategic plan. It may be much more operational. But the, the thing is, whatever the planning thing is, uh, you as presidents, I really ask you to support your president-elect in working with your club right now. Uh, so that's my commercial on that. Uh, and uh, in the interest of getting everybody uh, I, I, able to leave at eight o'clock, uh, and, and I'm on for staying uh, however long that people want to stay, but I'm going to run through a few other items here. Uh, and I'll run through them quickly and we can, you know, any of them we can talk about, but there are some, some information items. Uh, one is awards. Uh, we've got district awards season coming up. This happens every year, and uh, every year it's so easy to forget that we have people that are really deserving of awards uh, and clubs. <laughs> we have a Club of the Year award. Uh, and so we really encourage people to uh, nominate appropriately for our different district awards. Um, they're, they're on the website, uh, and Carol Doyle, our awards chair, has sent out a note to the district. And so we're very much encouraging uh, awards. We're encouraging the district governors, uh, the assistant governors. We're encouraging everybody uh, that, that take a look uh, and see what makes sense in terms of awards. Uh, and Lauren just gave you the, the sort of passionate commercial about the uh, foundation awards uh, because they're, uh, you know, where it shows uh, how sometimes how, how wonderful this is. It, 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 uh, we, we have lots of achievements and lots to celebrate and it builds. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is Rotary International has sent us a reminder uh, that the uh, quote new logos and branding uh, has been out just about 10 years uh, and they uh, would like us to update. They would like our clubs, districts and so on to update our logos if we're not using the current logo. Uh, it, it is there as a basis to give us an identity and uh, having a common identity and so on. And you sure it, it transition when you change, but um, it, it, it's time. So they're, they're really encouraging us to make sure that our logos are updated and we're using the current uh, Rotary brand. Uh, and the, every, the information's in the brand center. And uh, if you've got any more questions, Peter Rope is here. So I'm gonna defer very much to him as our uh, public relations, public uh, image, uh, chair for uh, still a couple more months. Um, another point is conference. We have district conference coming up uh, April 28th to 30. Uh, you've probably all heard me give a commercial, but I'll give another quick one. Uh, it's uh, everything's on the website if you want to register, uh, if you haven't already, and uh, registrations have been coming along. Uh, we've got uh, roughly a couple hundred registered, uh, but we've still got room for more and uh, we're very much looking for more. Uh, and uh, there are still hotel rooms available at the uh, negotiated rate. Uh, and and uh, there are also sponsorship opportunities available. And sponsorship opportunities are really something that uh, 
if anybody knows of, of uh, any of your corporate members or businesses or whatever that might be on for uh, providing some sponsorship assistance and uh, there's a little bit of benefit there if, uh, in terms of visibility, uh, we'd very much encourage that. Uh, we set rates on the basis that we'll get some sponsorships in uh, to keep the rates down. They're a little slower than we'd like, so we're going to uh, very much encourage you to uh, uh, promote sponsorships if you get the chance. And I know it's not everybody's going to get the chance, and uh, it's all over the map. Some clubs are assisting. I'm, I'm that, that we're grateful for that, but I'm really aiming at the uh, corporate world. If we can uh, try and get as many sponsors in the corporate world. Uh, we have a better conference and uh, and it's a little cheaper. Uh, last thing is RILA, uh, Rotary Youth Leadership Awards. Uh, we have uh, RILA South, uh, as I hope you've gotten, hopefully not too inundated because uh, registrations were coming in a bit late. And so there were more emails than perhaps we'd have preferred, but um, in any event, registrations are picked right up through RILA South. Uh, and, uh, we're, 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 we're now looking like we're in, in good shape, but they can still take more. The deadline was is today, but um, they're, they're going to leave it open for another two or three dates. So if people have still got uh, folks for Ryla, um, you, can still, you can still register them. Uh, and I don't think, it doesn't look like we'll overshoot the capacity. Uh, the other thing that I'll let you know is that Ryla North is not happening this year. Uh, it has been, established that really it uh, there, there's been a change in volunteer uh, availability and uh, that's probably the the biggest thing I mean people from Prince George can add if they want to but it's uh, bottom line is it's not going to be happening it was a bit late as well uh, and so that's uh, and I don't know what lake else what is going to happen with lake else uh, the 13 to 15 year olds out of terrace um, that that's under review at the moment uh, and we'll We'll have more on that. Ryla South, though, is looking wonderful. It's great to be back face to face, uh, and uh, it, that that's something that they did uh, online and then tried to do online the second year, but there was just no interest. Uh, and uh, so there, but there's lots of interest now that we're back face to face. Uh, and uh, there, there, that's got a lot of people with uh, who are doing the instruction and. Uh, planning and so on. So it's, it's, I think it's really in good shape. Uh, but the other two are, are, are a bit struggling. Uh, okay, uh, Liz. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought up Ryla. Uh, I know the deadline was today. Um, we didn't have, we had kids, didn't have kids, but apparently we got two kids today that were signing up. How long do you think they're going to um, extend the uh, registration for? Because I may have a couple First Nation kids but I'm looking for any club that doesn't have kids that want to support a couple of kids. How do I find out a club that might have money that don't have kids? Uh, okay. Talk to me, Liz. Okay. And it's Sunday night is, is the deadline from James. Okay. Thank you yeah, so much. But, but talk to me about that. Cause we're kind of in the same position. So we have funding, we may have kids, but may not have. Okay. Kids. I just made a great contact with uh, Mount Curry for uh, Lewat nation Lovely. today. So it's really Beautiful. helping to, and, yeah, and I'd, thank you. I'd say to, and talk to Drew. Uh, Drew's not on this call. He's coming on Saturday's call. Drew Antrobus, our district governor nominee. Uh, Drew's in Richmond, and they're, um, in, they're in the same kind of boat where they thought they had kids, but it looks like they don't, and they do have money uh, for it. So I don't know. That, there's already been some brokering going on between clubs that have students and clubs that have money. So... Uh, I'm not exactly sure where this is at, but I'd say talk to Drew uh, as well. Uh, anybody else? Uh, well, I would just like to say, um, I think one of the complicating factors with Ryla is communication with the schools. And um, what we're experiencing in Pender Harbor is, um, Schools, uh, well, we have a high school where I think the principal is not full time admin. So uh, they're doing, you know, they're having to, they're like three quarters admin and a quarter running blocks and teaching and um, getting them to respond and, uh, you know, being able to find 
kids that want to go um, over the last number of years, well, of course, we got sidetracked with COVID, but I, I, I think Ryla has to uh, configure that with small rural areas where you have school principals whose communication um, abilities are severely hampered by the fact they're overwhelmed and they're not administrating full time. They're administrating part time and they're teaching blocks. And we've been struggling with that. Um, and it was very, very last minute getting our Ryler applicants in. And as a club with our funds, uh, we were put in a very difficult position on that because we went from basically uh, clubs agreeing for, we were told maximum two. Um, and in 24 hours, because of the way the motion was worded, which was we would pay for Ryla student, students who wanted to go to Ryla to go in 24 hours, we were up to five, which um, has really severely impacted our finances for bursaries, blah, 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 all of the other things. So I, I think with Ryla, that's something that um, has got to be considered that um, the communication with the schools is complicated and it's not incredibly efficient. And it really affects how we make those decisions with our budgetary funds. Yeah, I'm going to make some observations and then Linda's got her hand up. Um, the, the observations I'm going to make is that um, this year, uh, we, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, uh, there are some lessons learned here. Uh, we were too late uh, out of the gate with a lot of the RILA information. And, uh, you know, it, it, there, I'm not going to go through the reasons for that particularly, but that's the bottom line is that clubs were getting information on how to register and cost and so on quite late. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, that handicapped this is that, um, and it's true for a number of programs, uh, but for all our youth programs, uh, is that the uh, hiatus that we had with COVID took away our continuity from year to year. And this took away our continuity with kids. It took away our continuity with Rotarians and Rotary clubs who may not have budgeted the same. You're, you're used to budgeting from one year to another. You have more gaps, more turnover and so on. And the memory isn't there. Uh, and with the school. And so uh, you, you, you don't have that kind of continuity. So we didn't probably recognize quite enough the challenge that uh, that that created for us. But I think your point's absolutely well taken that we've got to be better prepared and we've got to be prepared earlier. Having said all that, the other observation I want to make is that it's not RILA that's going to deal with directly, in my view, with the schools. It's the clubs. We have to equip the clubs to be able to deal with the schools. Linda, over to you. Yeah, I was I was going to say exactly the same thing. All that, that RILA mm -hmm. South does or should be doing is facilitating the program. It's really up to the clubs to figure out how and the best way to promote that program in their community. And and if you if your only form of contact is through the schools, then you know maybe you can look at at doing some other online or social um, social media marketing or or advertising for the program. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be done specifically through their school. It's super easy, especially if you have an interact club because you have that connection, but not all Rotary clubs have that. Um, definitely, we're coming off of, um, you know, three years of not having an in-person um, program and not having those uh, kids coming back from the program and talking about it at school and hyping it up and having, you know, these um, new students thinking, okay, next year, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply for RILA. We haven't had that for three years. So we're kind of starting um, uh, almost from step one. And um, I think it, it still comes down to the individual clubs supporting the program. Um, I will say, because I've been involved <laughs> with all three RILAs for the last number of years, that it's it's the individual Rotary clubs that either make or break RILA. And if you don't support the program, hence North and hence Lake Owls, possibly, 
the programs are not are not going to go. So it's, you know, John talked about the responsibility that we have to support, um, you know, regionally or district wide rotary and, and what we do within it. Ryla is is just like that as well. And I think it's our responsibility as clubs and as Rotarians to support the program so that we have it um, in the future. And that's all I'll say. I, as you can tell, I'm a little <laughs> passionate about that. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. If anybody doesn't know, uh, Linda has been, she's been Ryla chair, but uh, she's she's been more than that. She's been everything with, with Ryla, including uh, featured in uh, Rotary Magazine as part of what she was doing with Ryla with our district. So Linda, I would say I totally agree with you. But with small um, rural areas, um, it's I, I I think there's a difference with how you promote Ryla in uh, the the metro areas as opposed to the small rural areas. So we're very happy to be sending five kids this year, but it was um, a very complicated process for us from a budget perspective um, to deal with it at the very, very last minute, uh, and depending on our funds and which fund we, we want to take it out of the, our gaming funds. And uh, there's a complicated issue with our calendar gaming funds that are held by Seashell. So it became a very, very complicated um, situation when we went from probably we're only going to have two, we had the money to do that, from our own gaming funds. And then suddenly within 24 hours, it went up to five. And it created a, a lot of difficulties with our clubs, our club in terms of committing to that. But anyway, we got it through and five kids from Penda Harbor are gonna go to Ryla South, which I think is really good. But I think um, from my perspective as a president, um, I, I was kind of like thrown for a loop on it all. And I, I would have liked um, to know a little bit more about the history and the commitment so that I could lead my members into making more prudent and judicial decisions on our gaming funds in terms of how we were going to support this. Um, it, it was all very last minute. And, you know, uh, it, it, it created, um, you know, uh, you know, we had members that were like, we're not paying for anything. And so I, I think in the future going forward, um, I, I would like to see um, more, more information coming out earlier, I guess, so that we make these decisions with a, a timeline that wasn't compressed to what we were dealing with. It was very last minute and um and it was it was i mean there were people that were very passionate about sending kids to ryla and the people that were you know not that convinced and as a president i i i can't um you know project my views and opinions either way i have to manage it and mediate it so that the best and most democratic course of events proceed. So I, I, I think, and I understand with all of the nightmares we've gone through with COVID, um, but I, I don't know about the timelines, but I, I, yeah, if the timelines would have been a little um, earlier, and it may have been part of the fact that my youth director disappeared for to Mexico for a month, <laughs> Which had to deal with that could be. But that's what we have to deal with all the time, right? Is we've got yeah. all these members who they disappear and they leave, and that's their role. But anyway, I'm just putting that out there, Linda. It's not a yeah. criticism. It is not. It's just saying there's a reality that it's complicated and it's not very straightforward. Put it that way. And. Jane, I would completely agree with you. I'm originally from Kitimat, so we always struggle to find students to send. Um, I would just say that w within RILA, the organizing committees, we've always tried different things. 
beginning earlier, getting the information to clubs. And then by the time you're actually ready for registration, they don't even want to hear from you anymore because we started too early. Then we start a little bit later and then exactly. it's not enough time. I get that. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's that, so we, we keep trying to improve the program and, and I'm not really part of it now, but still have contact with James and um, they're just, they're really trying to get back after these three years of COVID and what is the best way to kind of go about doing that. And we also understand that every club in every community is different and how they approach their community, their school to get students is completely different. So we kind of leave that to the club. So like, what's the best way for you to do your thing and just do it well, and then, you know, hopefully register students. But thank you for your your comments. Uh, very well taken. Thank well, that's very understandable. And I appreciate this connection with you. Because it's, um, as a, a new president, um, of course, only being a Rotarian and joining at the beginning of COVID for two years, I was commandeered into presidency, as you can imagine. And um, it's been a journey figuring out um, how the whole thing operates. Right. So, and I'm a total, I mean, I'm a retired teacher. So of course I'm completely involved in youth and totally support it, but um, it was a, a pretty complicated, difficult uh, situation for our club. Feel uh, feel free to call me anytime about Ryla. Well, I'd I would be more really than happy to chat thank with you. you. Very much. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank well, you. And thanks everybody. And I, I'm so I'm, it's it's wide open to t discussion, uh, questions, uh, input, dialogue, anything you like on anything Rotary. Uh, I actually had one thing um, in regards to branding that I was going to ask, and it, if I can just take a, a few seconds, how does branding work for uh, specifically youth programs that are not under the umbrella of the district, such as Tweedsmere Trek, Adventures programs, and other programs that clubs put on that specifically a youth program that has that rotary attachment to it? And how do we keep them all kind of united that they're using the correct branding within um, their youth program and possibly a logo for that program? Yeah. Uh, okay. Peter, I'm sure can answer that, but it's, it, but it, it, I just want to say it extends to everything. It's not just youth. It extends to everything. Yeah. Uh, and, and anything the club is doing. Uh, it, it's the, you know, the, we need to follow the rules on branding and the approaches. But the thing is, remember that branding is there to help with our outreach, to help with our image, to help us give uh, the, the wonderful impression of Rotary. Peter. Well, the, the title slide at the beginning of the session is an example of uh, learning and development uh, came up with a, a standard look for all the different programs, uh, the President's Forum, the PE's forums, the all the various sessions that we put on. Uh, so uh, something like that could be developed uh, for the youth programs as a group, um, but it all fits within. We did have an earlier learning and development uh, logo, if you like, but it didn't quite meet the RI standard. So that's uh, the first time I've used that new newer look and it's, um, Anyway, we, we, we can, I can talk to you, Linda, uh, offline, and we could maybe work out some examples of how that might work for you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, if we are... Oh, Cam. Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, just a quick one for Lauren. Um, Lauren, is the PowerPoint that you showed um, on the 5040 website? And if not, is it possible to get it? Probably after Saturday. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And the reason being, this has been recorded, so I, I will make sure that Peter has it in his bailiwick there. But um, ultimately, we're going to present this on Saturday. It's always better on Saturday. So just let you guys know, come up Saturday. Okay. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a commercial, but Lauren is really saying that he needed uh, uh, this group as, as guinea pigs for a trial run so he can do it well on Saturday. <laughs> 
That that information though, Lauren, is, is really great for us to have for our clubs. So if we ever do any type of foundation, um, uh, not training, but just even information, like that's really good because it's updated information and those numbers are really impressive. Anytime you need support, uh, please call us. We have a crew of professionals, including Ian Grant, myself, Del Peterson, um, you know, and Bill's not shy either. And uh, Brian Finley always likes to talk about uh, uh, <laughs> things as well. So, so you know, we got five very passionate people at the district uh, level that are willing to be there for you. So, Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your evening, and uh, we'll see a few of you back on Saturday. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, John.